In part one, we covered the long history of the Maribyrnong Explosives Factory. If you haven't seen it, check it out here in the top right hand corner for some context. So let's start by talking about what remains on the site. Due to its size, there are plenty of things still around. If you'll remember from part one, the current road bridge carrying Rayleigh Road across the Maribyrnong River was built in 1967. This replaced the two separate bridges, one for trams and one for road vehicles. You can still see remnants of the tram bridge at low tide. Here on the west bank of the river, underneath the current bridge, there are about 15 wooden foundation posts still visible in the mud, as well as other support beams and structures. Unfortunately, nothing appears to remain of the original road bridge just north of here, other than part of the alignment of Angler's Way. If you keep heading west to Cordite Avenue, you will come across the last remaining area still owned by the Department of Defence. There are hundreds of buildings and other structures dotted across the landscape. All along the road and tram reservation are these double-storey brick buildings, and you can even see inside some of them. If you look hard enough, you might be lucky to spot a control panel or two in some of the lower levels. These buildings, laboratories and testing areas were linked with a maze of walkways, access roads and an extensive network of rail tracks. These were used by small carts to carry munitions and other materials to different areas. Rails were used because they were far more stable than loading them into trucks to take them along bumpy roads. Given some of the highly volatile materials in use, such as nitroglycerin, this seems like a good idea. The Route 57 tram also still terminates here in its original location on Cordite Avenue, and the Williamson Road siding now connects to track along Gordon Street through to Footscray on what is now the Route 82. The original siding directly to the front gate on Cordite Avenue is now gone, having been removed in 2000. Further south between Wests Road and Cordite Avenue is the former Royal Australian Field Artillery site. This is a sprawling complex of mainly brick buildings, mostly built throughout 1911 and 1913. Today the unit is known as the Royal Regiment of Australian Artillery, but it traces its origins all the way back to pre-Federation and the first soldiers of the British Royal Artillery to arrive in Australia in 1856. The buildings on this site range from barracks for officers and enlisted men through to parade grounds and stables, the latter being necessary as horses were used to move heavy equipment and guns. After the artillery left the site and the factory expanded, the buildings were converted to research and administration offices for the explosives factory. It is one of the few and most intact pre-World War I military sites left in Victoria. It has retained most of the heritage despite being developed to housing in the late 1990s and early 2000s. I think these structures look very nice and have been well preserved. These three bungalow houses were built for the unit's commanding officers, while these two large administration buildings to the rear, built later in 1940, have been converted into apartments. The street names also reference the site's past, such as Rimfire Walk and Raffa Court, which is a nice touch. I think the best part though is the former main entrance. You can still see today where the original access gate was located between these two gatehouse buildings, which would have housed guards. These lovely 1940s concrete posts are also still in place. What's also interesting is you can see how the entrance lines up with the tram stop just across West Road which, if you'll remember, was specifically built to service this part of the site. The parade ground in the centre of the development has been turned into a very nice small park, with some seating and trees. My favourite thing though is the old air raid siren. It's the only one that I know of that's left in its original position, at least in Melbourne. It would have been part of the factory's protection scheme from anticipated Japanese air raids during the Second World War. While it may seem far-fetched today, in hindsight, there was a very real worry of significant air attacks in southern Australia throughout much of the war. As a result, most of Melbourne's limited anti-aircraft defences were concentrated around important military sites like Maribyrnong. This siren would have been used to signal a warning and all-clear noise in the event of an air raid, which thankfully never came. I think it's fantastic that it's still here, and I do hope it still works. On the southern boundary of the former RAFA site is the former pyrotechnic section of the explosives factory. In 1949, 
It lay disused and was converted into temporary housing for 600 newly arrived migrants in tens of temporary Nissan huts as the Maribyrnong Migrant Hostel. This was then rebuilt with more permanent buildings called the Midway Hostel and Phillips Centre in 1969 and 1971 respectively. Through this time, it was also used as temporary accommodation for other uses, including naval personnel and refugees displaced by Cyclone Tracy in 1974. Then in 1983, the centre downsized and the rest was developed as student housing for Victoria University. The remaining part was the Maribyrnong Detention Centre, which finally closed in 2018. This marked 73 years of use as a site for migrants. Parts of it are heritage listed, and it remains the largest and only surviving purpose-built post-World War II migrant hostel in Victoria. Most of these structures though are still there, including one of the original Nissen huts. Unfortunately, there aren't many traces of the original pyrotechnic section still here, from what I can see. The bulk of the site has been disused for many years. My guess as to why is that the site is still quite contaminated from its earlier uses in the pyrotechnic section, which makes it difficult and expensive to rebuild anything with today's safety standards. However, it is earmarked as the site of the new Maidstone tram depot for the G-Class trams, so it should be in use once again soon. If you want to learn more about this, check out my video on the new G-Class trams right here in the top right hand corner. Finally, let's talk a bit about the factory's design and operations. Buildings and structures were carefully designed with several safety features. No building was nearer than 70 yards, or 64 metres of each other, to avoid the spread of a possible fire. Storerooms were surrounded by mounds of earth to contain any explosions, and large trees, mainly cypress pines, were planted to catch any flying debris. Many of these trees still remain. Health and safety regulations were also rigidly enforced, given the dangers involved. These included checks for hairpins to avoid the risk of sparks, and even cutting fingernails short to reduce the chances of causing an explosion due to friction. Despite careful precautions and Premier Bent's reassurances in 1911, there were many incidents over the life of the factory. The first publicly recorded one was on the 7th of December 1916, when an analytical chemist, Richard Quigley, was badly burned on his face, arms and legs after some mercury with which he was working exploded. Other explosions included in 1926, which started a small fire, and in 1935. When the Second World War started and activity on the site greatly increased, the number of incidents also went up. One of the most severe occurred in December 1940, when one worker was killed and four more injured when a section of the pyrotechnics buildings exploded. Several more occurred throughout 1941 and 42, with more workers killed and injured. A 1950 explosion, which killed a worker named Robert Crago, even showered surrounding areas with pieces of lead falling from the sky. But it wasn't just the munitions buildings that were built to consider these hazards. Just off Rosamond Road is this fascinating old substation for the tram extension, built in 1941-42. It was constructed in a design hard up against a steep rock embankment from an abandoned quarry, to protect it from any bombs dropped by attacking aircraft. Other features to protect it from possible air raids included a roof with no straight lines and random holes cut to disguise it as some kind of water feature if seen from aerial reconnaissance photos. Amazingly, it was still in use until 2005, when a new substation was built nearby to replace it. It's still more or less intact, but a bit hard to find, especially given all the effort to camouflage it. There is of course a lot more detail to cover, but I think we'll leave it there. Because the Maribyrnong Explosives Factory was such an important and large site, there were probably hundreds more stories to be told. Its existence and operations no doubt changed the course of Victoria's and Australia's history, even beyond its main uses as a munitions manufacturing facility. The tram lines, industrial uses and roads throughout Maribyrnong were all directly or indirectly a result of the factory and would not be in place as they are today without it. Thousands of migrants and refugees pass through here, and today thousands more call the area home. It's probably the largest and most intact remains of any wartime use in Melbourne, and despite most of it not being publicly accessible still, it's well worth a visit. I hope you enjoyed this two-part series on the Maribyrnong Explosives Factory. 
Please subscribe if you would like to stay up to date on future videos and feel free to click the like button as well. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.